So it's 2.15 according to my clock, so we can get started. Uh, before we start with uh, the review, uh, Alok had an announcement. Uh, so Alok, do you want right. to? Uh, so uh, we have a slight revision in the schedule. If one would go to the, uh, the schedule web part of the, uh, the, the website, you would see that uh, we have uh, uh, Enrico uh, Payer as the next speaker. Uh, uh, three to three thirty, and then uh, at the end, so we're going to be ending with uh, David Gayoto's uh, talk at six, and we are traditionally at least fifteen minutes late, so you need to add at least fifteen minutes to all the start times of all talks. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's about it. Thanks. Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, so we are very happy to have uh, Joao Penedones, who's going to tell us about. The S matrix reloaded. So take it away, Joao. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aninda. Uh, yeah, it's really a pleasure to talk at the Indian Strings meeting uh, again. I, I remember the first Indian Strings meeting I participated 10 years ago in Puri. And uh, it was super nice walks, walks on the beach and, uh, and super great food and great and great science. Yeah, I hope I hope you can do it uh, live again uh, soon. OK, so. Um, so first thing, let me. I'm supposed to give a review talk and uh, this is a very old subject and OK, I. We started working on it maybe about six, seven years ago. So there's already a lot of work and I list here all the collaborators that I've worked with on this topic. So I will uh, cover the main algorithm that is being used, but I will focus on one specific application. Okay, so I will not make a, like an exhaustive review where every slide is a different topic and it's impossible to, to follow, okay. So, but before that, let me just uh, admit that I'm very much outdated. So the right title should be this one. The, the movie just came out yesterday, I think. So you, if you like uh, the old uh, Matrix Reload, that maybe you will also like this new one. I, I, I haven't seen it yet, so let's see. Okay, so, uh, so this is the outline. So as I said, uh, I will focus on this, sorry, on this example of 2 to 2 graviton scattering. And I will explain the main algorithm for this non-perturbative S matrix bootstrap in this context. Okay. But um, there will have, I hope we will have some time for a big discussion on more open problems and uh, general directions. So let me start uh, in the beginning. So the beginning, I think, is in uh, during the war, actually, when Eisenberg wrote uh, a series of papers with this title, The Observable Quantities in the Theory of Elementary Particles. And, uh, and the motivation was actually quite modern in the sense that he, he was thinking, well, he was troubled by the infinities that appear in uh, perturbative calculations in quantum field theory. So at the time, this was still very poorly understood. And so we thought, well, let's think about physical observables like scattering uh, events. So he, was think he, he formulated the properties of the S matrix as a physical observable. And he tried to understand what were the main uh, properties that this uh, physical observables have to obey. Okay, so then later on, this really became very popular in the 60s, um, essentially in the context of the strong interaction. So in that context, you have many, many hadrons, many resonances, and uh, well, one can measure some cross sections, some scattering amplitudes between these objects, and there is no field theoretical calculation to predict this, right? Because it's a strongly coupled theory. So, uh, so the idea that became very popular was this idea of nuclear democracy that all particles are equal. There's no elementary particles and composites. They should all be treated equal. 
And well, actually, this was very much based on the idea of resi trajectories that all particles fall on resi trajectories. So they are really tied together and uh, the full consistency of the theory should uh, fix the theory entirely. So, so here you have Jeffrey Shu, which was the main uh, uh, promoter of this uh, idea. In fact, I think people used to say, uh, there is no God but, that, but Mandelstam and Shu is his prophet. Okay. So, but it seems that uh, Mandelstam himself was a bit of an agnostic. He never really subscribed to this uh, bootstrap gospel entirely. He, was, he would usually went back to quantum field theory calculations to, to check his, uh, his ideas. But, uh, but this was very popular in the 60s. But uh, this idea that you could fix the theory entirely just from consistency properties of the S matrix, in the end, basically it failed and it had to fail because we know there are many consistent quantum field theories. So we're not gonna find a unique solution. We are going to find some space of allowed solutions. Uh, well, nevertheless, this was actually very fruitful because it gave rise to string theory. For example, the, the Veneziano amplitude was written as an example of this amplitude that contains all particles in Reggie trajectories. And, uh, and another, another related um, topic is uh, S matrices in two dimensions where if you assume integrability, no particle production, then in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a lot of progress. People really just solved some 2D quantum field theories by bootstrapping the S matrix, by guessing the S matrix just from first principles, plus this principle of integrability of no particle production. Okay? So this was led by, by the Zamologikovs. But in higher dimensions, not much progress was done. Uh, until more recently, and, uh, and the motivation from that came from a parallel program, which you know very well, which is the conformal bootstrap program that started a bit later in higher dimensions. So these, these were the, if you want, the seminal papers. But these papers really didn't have too much impact because at the time, okay, these are very complicated equations. What are we going to do with this? It was a bit unclear. The big impact came when it was applied to two dimensions in this famous paper, the, the BPZ paper. And, uh, and there you know the story, right? Minimal models, conformal field theory. Um, it was an explosion of, of work, but it was again very much limited to two dimensions where conformal symmetry is infinite dimension. So the main breakthrough in higher dimensions came with um, with this paper in 2008 by our friends here. And, um, and this is where I was, okay? This is, so I was working on the conformal bootstrap with applications to holography, conformal blocks. I was thinking about this. And in the back of my mind was this problem. Why this works so well for con conformal field theory? Like for example, we know this beautiful success story where you can map the space of theories and isolate theories with super high precision in these small islands. How come this works so well for conformal field theories and the same idea just does not work for a massive quantum field theory? What, what are we doing wrong? And, uh, and yeah, that was basically the origin of, uh, of our work was to try to apply exactly the same philosophy that was so su successful in the conformal case to the non-conformal case. And the philosophy, let me just uh, tell you the main steps. You choose an observable, physical observable, then you list the consistency conditions, and then you use that to bound the space of theories. Right? So it's very simple uh, algorithm. And um, and we knew how to do it in principle, right? I mean, this table, I think everybody more or less knew how to do this table 50 years ago, or maybe, okay, let's say 10 years ago, for sure. 
Okay, so so this was the table of the analogy. You pick an observable. So in conformal field theory, the good observable to pick is the four-point function. Sorry, this this is just distracting you here. The four-point function, and in uh, in massive quantum field theory, the natural observable to pick is the Two to two scattering amplitude. Okay, so again, here there's a kind of an art. You have to choose an observable that is sufficiently rich to constrain the theory and sufficiently simple to work with. Okay, so somehow the balance is when you get to a function of two variables. So that's what experience has taught us so far. And uh, and so that's the good analogy. And then okay, you have crossing symmetry, which here is just permutation of the external points. And, and here is a, a permutation under the Mandelstam invariance. And, uh, and then you have this, the use of the Hilbert space. So you decompose the Hilbert space in irreducible representations of your symmetry group. So this is what I was doing here. So you, you insert here the resolution of the identity. And if you do it in conformal field theory, you get an expansion of the four point function in conformal blocks. And if you do it in scattering amplitudes, you get an expansion of the amplitude in partial waves. And then the last constraint is unitarity. So these coefficients, these lambdas, are squares of OP coefficients. So they are positive. And in the scattering case, these Fs can be put together to form probabilities of going from two to two particles with fixed spin L. And so they are bounded by one. Okay, so you see that actually the last line is different. You see that the nature of the constraint is slightly different. And, and that, that actually, there is where it lies many of the difficulties in translating direct translation of the methods of conformal field theory to the S matrix. Okay, so this, is, this was where we were a few one, 10 years ago. And, uh, and since we were so confident about conformal field theory, the first thing we tried to do was really to say, well, maybe the S matrix is too difficult. People have thought about this for many decades. Let's try to use the conformal bootstrap to get bounds about quantum field theory, massive quantum field theory. And the way to do that is to put the quantum field theory in ADS. Okay, so, so that was our first eureka moment, if you want, was when we tried this. We put a quantum field theory in ADS, and then we try to use the bootstrap, the conformal bootstrap for boundary correlation functions to get information. Well, if you want, you have boundary correlation functions like the four point function here to get information about the, the S matrix if you want here. And, uh, and I mean, the, the Eureka moment was this plot. And I think this was about in 2015 or something, I was at CERN and we, we were able to make this plot where we showed that, um, so if you, if you take this flat space limit seriously, you predict that dimensions of scalar operators scale like uh, the radius, M times the radius, and the OP coefficients scale like uh, the um, scale exponentially with the dimensions, okay? So the dimensions go to infinity in the flat space limit, right? This goes to infinity. And so you see that um, uh, there is this exponential dependence that you can really predict just by computing, just by computing this diagram in ADS, a simple diagram that you can compute that relates OP coefficients to bulk couplings. And, uh, and the remarkable thing that we found is that by doing the numerics in ADS, so by finding a upper bound on the OP coefficient, as you increase delta, we actually matched precisely the slope predicted by this calculation. So we were able to derive bounds in flat space by extrapolating the uh, conformal bootstrap to infinite radius, okay? So this is okay, not, I, I, I realize this is quite fast. I'm not giving you all the details. This is just a personal note of how we actually entered this, uh, 
this topic. Sorry, your, can yes. I Sorry. Uh, so, uh, so this work I'm familiar with in, in, in two dimensions, right? I mean, the higher dimensions also you have this paper, but is there a, a very clear understanding of the um, uh, ADS uh, bounds going over to the flat space bounds? Yeah. Good, good question. Exactly. So this is uh, this success was in two dimensional both theory, and uh, and so far we have not been able to make the numerics work in higher dimensions. But um, I, I believe that's a numerical. I see. So you're saying that's numerical. numerical difficult because you see here you you can see it here. You see that to see this slope that was predicted. You have to first try this n is the number of derivatives in the, in the usual conformal bootstrap. So you have to go to very high number, 200. And then still, you, I mean, 200 is still here. So then you still have to extrapolate with some fits in one over n to get down to the orange curve, which is the extrapolation curve. So this is completely out of reach in uh, higher dimensions. So, so, but that's a very good question because that's exactly what I want to. So you, you believe that's only a numerical issue that uh, it will go down after the other uh, last Yeah, I believe it's a numerical issue. Yeah, but it's I mean, but it's very important because it basically tells you that uh, you're not going to be successful by your only using this approach. So. Um, well, let me just finish what I wanted to say. So what uh, what we did then two dimensional conformal field theory. Can you, I think there is a lot of feedback. Yeah, there is echo. Maybe you can mute yourself. OK. So. Um, so what I was saying is that so this you can do this for fixed ratios of of the delta two over delta one, which corresponds to the ratios of the masses in flat space. And from this conformal bootstrap extrapolation, you get these red dots on the bounds of cubic couplings in flat space. And, uh, and then since we get this nice bound, we try to derive it directly from S matrix. And we indeed, in this case, this is actually very simple. So you actually can derive an analytic formula. And you see here that uh, the blue curve matches precisely the red dots, OK? So this was our uh, first success. And uh, ah, let me just tell you this, uh, this funny fact. So, so after we did this, we found out that actually this formula for 2D S matrix uh, bootstrap was already done in a very nice two-page paper by Michael Kreutz in 72. And this beautiful two-page paper, it's very, very nice and clean derivation just using complex analysis, had zero citations for 40 years, OK? So this is, this is I, I think this is the example I know of uh, some very good paper being completely unnoticed for 40 years and then uh, now I think it has about 10, I don't know, it's not, not a lot, but at least it's, uh, it's recognized as a very good paper. Okay, so this is the end of my uh, broad historical introduction with some personal notes. And, uh, and now I want to focus on a very more specific application of the S matrix bootstrap directly in higher dimensions and uh, and in particular i will focus on one example okay so so the s matrix bootstrap is just a general method that you can use to bound properties of the s matrix so in particular you can apply it to the s matrix of massless particles of some effective field theory and bound wilson coefficients okay so that's a big industry an important topic and so We've done that to, in several models, like the flux tube in two-dimensional flux tube of a confining gauge theory, or the pions, so the, the chiral Lagrangian. We're also working on photons, so the, the Euler-Eisenberg Lagrangian, but I cannot uh, 
explain everything in a reasonable way in one talk. So I will focus on one application and uh, the method is more or less the same. It's just a different application that changes. Okay, so um, any question about the big picture or before I, I go into explaining uh, this specific application? So I never really understood how the massive case uh, was brought into this picture. You, you said the initial motivation was that, right? Yes. So, so massive, massive is even simpler than massless like I'm doing here. So because here I'm doing massless theories, they have massless particles, but they're not conformal to theories. So... So they, I mean, they fall in the same class of uh, quantum field theories, which are only Poincaré invariant. So uh, you have to, you cannot use conformal bootstrap anyway, right? So, so it, it's in that sense as difficult as a mass gap. And in fact, it's harder. If you have a mass gap, you, your numerics converge better. You have more theorems about uh, some analyticity uh, domains. So, um, so I could also talk about that. There is also results on, say, bounds on quartic couplings, if you want, or, or cubic couplings in mass, in theories with a mass gap. Well, actually, the one I'm showing you here had a mass gap, right? This was parti massive particles, but this was two-dimensional. We now have done also higher dimensions, but uh, numerically, right? We don't have an, an analytic formula like this one. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, Joe, can I ask just one small question? So with the with the gravitons in the, uh, I mean, they, when you do asymmetric bootstrap with gravitons, I mean, are you assuming crossing or, or is there some? Uh... Yes, so I will, uh, I will uh, uh, explain that. Okay. Of course, if you're just doing uh, scattering amplitudes in quantum field theory, you, it's a much more solid uh, background, right? You have some things you can prove starting from, let's say, LSZ definition of the scattering amplitude. So you can prove crossing or you can prove some analyticity domains and, uh, and things like that. In the gravitational case, we don't have that luxury. So yeah. we will, essentially what we will assume is that the properties we see in amplitudes that we compute in the effective field theory, order by order in the low energy expansion, uh, persist to all orders. Say the crossing and analyticity that we see in perturbative graviton scattering amplitudes, we're going to assume they exist. They are also true non perturbative. But that's definitely an assumption. We don't have a first principle proof of that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so, so let me just uh, explain the problem. Okay, so now this is about the problem. So, so the problem is about higher derivative corrections to gravity. So GR is the low energy effective field theory and you want to know what bounds can you put on the Wilson coefficients of the higher derivative corrections. So we will do this in the simplest possible context which is maximal supergravity in 10 dimensions. Okay, so it's, it's simpler because supersymmetry super helps you deal with all the complexities of the helicities. And, uh, and the way it does it is this formula. So we're going to focus on the 2 to 2 scattering of gravitons, or in fact, the full supermultiplet. And, uh, and Supersymmetry, maximal supersymmetry tells us that this full amplitude is fixed up to a scalar function, which is fully crossing symmetric uh, of the Mandel sum invariance. Okay, so there's a prefactor that uh, takes care of the helicities and which particle in the super multiplet of the graviton you want to focus on. Okay, so that's that's why. This is a simpler problem, and we started with this problem. And then what do we know about this? Well, we know the low energy behavior that supergravity predicts. So in fact, it will be useful to focus on a particular component, which we'll call T, 
which is the scattering amplitude of two charged scalars. Okay, so these charged scalars, they are just some spin zero uh, components of the supermultiplet. So for example, in type 2b is the axi dilaton. And so this t, so this uh, factor r for this charge scalar just reduces to s to the fourth, the Mandelstam invariant, it's as simple as that. And you see that the prediction from supergravity is very simple, it's just the t and the u channel exchange of a graviton between two charge scalars, okay, two identical charge scalars. And so in the second line, I wrote the corrections. So now this T, okay, this is exactly, I mean, this factor and this factor are the same. They might not look, but it's really trivial algebra. And the first correction to supergravity, which is this term, is a constant. And this is the main focus of this talk. Okay, so this constant is directly related to the first Wilson coefficient in the effective action of uh, 10 dimensional uh, supergravity or the UV completion of supergravity that preserves maximal supersymmetry. And the first correction appears exactly at R to the fourth. Okay, so, but I mean, alpha for me, it will really be the, this coefficient in the scattering amplitude. And notice it's a dimensional parameter because I'm measuring everything in Planck units. Okay? So that's the definition. We're gonna, the question we're gonna ask is what are the possible values that alpha can take compatible with having a unitary and analytic S matrix, okay? And causal S matrix. And what do we know about alpha? Well, we know quite a lot because we have string theory and in string theories, alpha can be computed exactly both in type 2a and in type 2b. So let's look at type 2a first. You have here a very simple formula, elementary formula in terms of the string coupling of type 2a, and you can plot it and you see it as a minimum. So the allowed values, um, the allowed values of uh, alpha in type 2a start from 0 0.14 and go to infinity. And you see actually infinity corresponds to weak coupling in string theory. And, uh, and this, there's a similar story for uh, uh, type 2b. Uh, here it's a bit more complicated because you have a complexified string coupling. So the alpha is this Eisenstein, um, non-holomorphic Eisenstein series on the fundamental domain. But again, you can plot it and you see that the minimum happens here at the cusp of the fundamental domain. And it's again about 0 0.14, okay? So, so this is what we learned from string theory. Alpha above 0 0.14 should be healthy. We know UV completions of supergravity that have that alpha. Then another thing we know is that we know alpha must be positive, okay? So that follows from some simple uh, argument. You can just go to the S complex plane at fixed T um, and um, and do some standard dispersive arguments to derive this sum rule. So you see that you have an integral over the imaginary part of forward scattering. So this is positive by the optical theorem and therefore alpha must be positive. You can also check that this is IR finite. So you can compute the IR behavior of this imaginary part just from the effective field theory. It's just a one loop calculation effective field theory. And you see it starts as S to the fifth. It cancels this, uh, this prefactor. So this is a perfectly UV IR finite uh, sum rule for alpha. So alpha is positive. So that's the summary. A priori, we know that alpha is positive. So this is impossible. Let's call it the desert that Alpha bigger than 0 0.14 must be possible because it exists in string theory. So we call it a garden. And there's a gap, very small in the middle, which we don't know. Are there any UV complete, uh, any UV completions of supergravity that have alpha less than 0 0.14? Okay. So that's that's the question. 
that we can address with the estimated bootstrap. Is it clear? Is the question clear? So now I will explain how the S-matrix booster can address this question, but uh, it's important that the question is clear. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so as I said, this is a general algorithm. So what is the algorithm? There's basically three steps in the algorithm. First, we just write an ansatz that obeys all these properties. Exactly, okay? So here there's no approximation. It just does this exactly. Okay, so again, I already mentioned this, but uh, let me emphasize that uh, we assume, so we will impose the strongest form analyticity, sometimes called Mandelstam analyticity, uh, which even in quantum field theory is not proven. So uh, we will assume, yes. Hello, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, if I may just ask, uh, like, I'm a bit confused that there is a, actually a uh, lower bound. I mean, I would have uh, normally thought any small alpha would be allowed, uh, but uh, uh, if it's... Sorry, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't really understand the the sound is is a bit cut. Sorry, I was asking you know, like why isn't some infinitesimal alpha not allowed? Could you kind of repeat that argument? Um, why alpha negative is not allowed? No, his question is why is an infinitesimal alpha not allowed? Plus two, let's say alpha. Infinite alpha is allowed. Yes. But that, that we, that's just weakly coupled string theory does that. No, no, uh, the question is infinitesimal. So very small alpha, why is that not allowed? Uh, he wants to know. Ah, uh, okay, good, sorry. I, I really, the sound is really difficult. Um, I mean, as I said, here, a priori, we don't know, but uh, that, that's a question. I, I don't think there is any reason why alpha so you're asking why alpha cannot be zero um yes yeah well Joy. we will argue that it cannot i mean if you want an intuitive explanation is uh, is the fact that gr by itself is not you be complete right if you just take supergravity the amplitude violates unitarity it grows too fast with energy so it needs to be UV completed and uh, it could be that alpha is zero, but maybe not. We're going to argue, and the numerics tells us that in any UV completion, alpha actually has to be bigger than about 0 0.14. So, so, but it's non obvious. But yeah. can, can we not make the observation that the imaginary part in the forward limit is related to total scattering cross section, which, uh, which uh, I mean, typically is not. I mean, if it was zero, then it would correspond to zero total scattering cross section. Yes, very good, very good. And in that, yeah, that's that's a better argument. So if alpha was exactly zero, it may it would mean that uh, there was no scattering. Yeah, right. Because this forward amplitude is related to total cross section. But okay, you could still think that it could be infinitesimal, but. Yeah, it, there is an actual finite bound in units of the in Planck units. Yeah, thanks, Aninda. Yeah, that's a better, a better answer. I thought zero point fourteen was a string theory computation that you got from string theory, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Zero point fourteen is a string theory. I'm I'm jumping ahead. So in we will see that the numeric is a series of results. But I'm jumping ahead. So I get a lot of feedback from TFR. If, if you have a question, ask, but otherwise it's better if you mute, but it gets a lot of feedback. Yeah, I don't think they have a question right now. Please. Okay. I, will, I will continue. Uh, okay, so I was here. There's three steps in the algorithm. The first one is an ansatz that obeys all this exactly. I will explain in detail how that is done. The second one is to impose unitarity 
And here we do it by decomposing in partial waves and imposing unitarity of each partial wave. So this we cannot do analytically. So we, we formulate this and we give these constraints to the computer. And then it becomes an optimization problem. You minimize alpha in this case, right? Choose some observable of the amplitude. In this case, we're going to focus on this alpha parameter, but um, we can do many, many other things. So let me give you just one more refinement that is crucial. Is that these ansatz will have a large number of parameters. Well, it will have a number of parameters, finite number of parameters that will be of order n square. So this n is crucial because we will have to extrapolate to large n to cover the full space of S matrices with these uh, properties. Okay, so there, there's an infinite function space, infinite dimensional function space. And so we need to send this n to infinity. And there's another important parameter, which is the number of unitarity constraints we put, which again cannot be infinity because we're doing it numerically. So there's another finite parameter L, which is up to which partial wave we impose unitarity, which we will have to extrapolate. Okay, so there's a final step of extrapolation um, in this algorithm. Okay, now I will go one, two, three, four uh, in with equations. Okay, so one. That's it. <laughs> Okay, that's uh, that's the the answer. So it's actually quite simple once once you think about it. So uh, so this is supergravity. Okay, so we just put it explicitly, and then we add this big sum. And what is the property of this big sum? Well, it's like a triple Taylor expansion in these variables: rho s, rho t, rho u. And what are these variables? These are just maps from the cut plane, S minus the cut from zero to infinity, where you expect the discontinuities from particle production in a massless theory. So it starts from zero and, uh, and rho is just a unit disk. Okay? So this is just an elementary map that a holomorphic map that brings the plane to the unit disk. And so the assumption of Mandel's time analyticity enters here. We're saying that functions are, that the S matrix is analytic in this cut plane. So it's analytic in this disk. Therefore, it can be well approximated by this Taylor series. And N is this truncation, okay? And the parameters are the coefficients of this Taylor series. And crossing is trivial to implement. We just make this uh, tensor symmetric so that it's permutation invariant under STU. Strictly speaking, what we're doing is an extension, right? This is, I'm writing it as a function of three variables, S, T, and U. Of course, what matters is the restriction to this physical set S plus T plus U equals zero. And, um, and that's, that's the way we uh, implement crossing um, by extending to three variables and then restricting. Okay. Now, can Any I ask questions? a small question? Yeah. Can I? Yeah. So, I mean, the because you have this, we have these multi-particle cuts. I mean, we don't expect this sum to converge uh, point by point in S, right? I mean, this. Uh, I mean, are you assuming yes. some uh, convergence of the sum in the? Yes, that's uh, that's a very good uh, a very good point, and it's a subtle a subtle point with this method, right? So you're saying you will have like branch points. Well, not here actually. Well, in a massless theory, all branch points accumulate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, even in a gap theory, you will have row, yeah, yeah. You will right. have branch points always here, but that's enough for your argument, right? You will have a branch right, point exactly. at the boundary. So the boundary of the unit disk is the is the radius of convergence. Is really the, right. the limit of the radius of convergence of this Taylor series. Right. So, so when you're going, when we now are going to evaluate the amplitude exactly at here, we right. seem to be to evaluate it at the limit of the convergence. Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. 
maybe i missed something but uh, uh, so, sorry uh, I... sorry just to so so what is the i didn't draw and didn't understand the answer the radius of convergence is zero strictly speaking that in this case right no no the radius of convergence is is one is the disk right because the uh, maybe maybe i should mark here with another color i don't know maybe this so here the center is in my unit is s equal minus one in Planck units. Okay, 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 thank you. So, so it's fine. There is a finite radius of convergence, but still you can worry that when we're gonna evaluate yes. the F matrix in the physical domain is gonna be exactly at the boundary. Yes. And um, I guess the okay. most honest answer is that it, it works. <laughs> if it okay. didn't work, this could be the reason. Then a posteriori, we can explain. So let's just say it like that. I'm, I'm creating a set of S matrices that have the right analyticity and the right, uh, all the right properties. Uh, now okay. you could worry that they do not really cover the full exact S matrix because when you send n to infinity, then it will not converge at the boundary. Okay, yeah. so there could be a problem of convergence as n goes to infinity. And so yeah. numerically, we see that that works. So we don't observe this problem. In practice, I, I suspect, but this has not been cleared up, that this has to do with the fact that uh, um, unitarity, in fact, yes, matrix, strictly speaking, should be thought of as distribution. So in fact, you should not evaluate unitarity pointwise. You should make like some small wave packets and so in practice, what that can be thought of is like just evaluating the S matrix slightly inside. So if you've got a slightly inside is like putting a small wave packet and that would smooth out the- Okay, thank you. Convergence. But yeah. Was there another question? Yeah, so uh, I thought the higher order correction, the R4 term was just alpha times S to the four. So uh, what are you doing right now? Right, but to, to bound this term, what we have to do is to really build the full S matrix. And then in the space of the full S matrix, where, where like we go to all S and T and U, we then check that it's compatible and then we go and measure what was the alpha. Okay, so, so of course to get the alpha, okay, maybe that I didn't say, but to get the alpha, you have to go here and Taylor expand around s equals zero. And this will start as a constant. In fact, this is what this prime means. You have to put some restrictions in this sum so that it indeed starts as the effective field theory uh, that we want. And there's also some other technical restrictions that it has good high energy behavior and all that. But it, this prime- okay, So now means, you're trying there to- There are some extra constraints that I'm not telling you about. You are trying to match the effective field theory computation with the string theory computation. Is that what you're trying to do? No, here there's no string theory, there's nothing. I'm just trying to write an S matrix, full S matrix for all energies that is consistent. And then I'm going to measure the alpha. And I'm going to try many, many S matrices to see what is the smallest alpha that I can get in, in an S matrix, but that is good to all energies. Yeah, but the initial computation of alpha that you got was in the string theory, right? This the, was in just the previous to, I, in yeah, the previous slide. This, this was just to check that uh, this was just like some a priori expectations for what alpha can be. I use the fact that we have some UV completions of supergravity that we trust, namely string theory. But in order right, for I, the but, in particular, we uh, know so the can, can I just advise that uh, you uh, you can ask a question maybe after the talk uh, uh, because uh, already 43, 44 minutes are up. So uh, maybe we should allow Joao to continue. Yes. Okay. I will. I will try to answer that better. I, yeah. I'm. I'm probably repeating myself. Okay. So. Um, so that was first step. Step number two is unitarity. Well, there are some equations here, but not very important the details the main thing is that unitarity for the full super amplitudes 
simplifies drastically using this identity of this prefactor. So this prefactor has this property that if you sum over the polarizations of the internal particle, it reproduces itself up to s to the power. Okay, so that's the essential property that we use. And using this property, one can show that unitarity of the full two to two super multiplet is equivalent to unitarity of this charge scalar. And that's that's the great simplification. So in practice, we just impose unitarity of the charge scalar. Okay, so you have two identical charge scalars. You expand in partial waves in the S channel. So this is the standard way of expanding partial waves. You take the amplitude, you integrate with the corresponding Gegenbauer polynomial, and that gives you the partial amplitude for a total energy square root of S and total angular momentum L. And the square is the probability from going to two gravitons to two, sorry, from two charge scalars to two charge scalars. And that has to be bounded by one. So it's as simple as that. The great I, property of this is that you see this S is linear in T. So this will give rise to quadratic constraints in our parameters beta. Okay, so this, sorry. These beta are our free parameters. They enter linearly in the amplitude. So, so these are quadratic constraints, but there are many of them. There is, there is one constraint for every S from bigger than zero. So the way we implement this is with a very dense grid of points from zero to infinity. And then there is one for every L from zero to capital L from zero to infinity and we truncate at capital L and this is the parameter we need to extrapolate in. Okay. So that's unitarity. And now we're done. We can now just give the problem to the computer. And uh, as I said, it's a problem with quadratic constraints. So it's called a semi-definite programming problem. And it can be solved very efficiently using the numerical algorithm that uh, Simon Zaffin wrote for the conformal bootstrap, this STPB uh, code. So I'm already showing you here the results in this plot as a function of the two parameters, L and N. I recall that L is the number of constraints. So as you increase L, it's harder to minimize alpha, right? We're trying to minimize alpha. If we put more constraints, it's harder. So it grows with L. And N is the other way around. So N is our freedom. So as you increase N, you are able to minimize more because you have more freedom in your answers. So now what we do is the extrapolation. That's the step number four. So what we will do first is to extrapolate in L to infinity. So that seems to be rather easy because you see you have these big plateaus. So for fixed N, when you go L to infinity, you get some uh, nice plateau that you can extrapolate to infinity. So this is what I'm showing you here. So for example, here, so for N equals 13, we extrapolate here. 14 here, 15, okay. And uh, we actually extrapolate, we can estimate the error by extrapolating with slightly different powers of one over L and choosing slightly different points. So we estimate the error. And then we extrapolate again to N equals infinity. So first infinite constraints and then infinite freedom. And uh, well, the result is what I already anticipated that uh, this two extrapolations lead precisely to a value around 0 0.14. Okay. So there is still some error, as you can see here, the error is significant because these numerics are quite challenging, but uh, it's very suggestive that indeed the bound coincides with what is realized in string theory. And uh, let me just, uh, so when we do this, we don't get just the minimum value of alpha, we get the full S matrix because we, we, we get the, all the parameters that minimize for which alpha is minimized. So we can look at the S matrix and in particular, we can look, sorry, this is just a summary. 
of where uh, of what we got okay it's uh, this these numerical results uh, match what uh, we expected from string theory and uh, as i said we can look at the s matrix and in particular we can look at the sum rule okay so alpha verify this sum rule we can look at uh, how does our optimal solution that has the minimum alpha satisfy the sum rule so we plot here the integrand and you see that the integrand has a very characteristic peak which corresponds to a resonance uh, and we can actually see this resonance in uh, it's a spin zero resonance and you can see it if we look at the spin zero phase shift we see that the spin zero phase shift indeed crosses pi over two like it should in any resonance uh, at around well three times the Planck mass square okay so so this resonance you can call it the gravity ball following these authors that found a similar resonance in, in 4D uh, gravitational scattering. And uh, well, I guess it's tempting to identify this resonance as the lightest massive string state that of course, as you turn on the string coupling, it becomes a resonance. And okay, maybe this is the lightest massive string state in uh, string theory. Okay, this is all I wanted to say about this example. Uh, I'm not sure how, how much time do I have or if there are some time for questions uh, before I go into the final discussion. Yeah, so around nine minutes, that is the, so you have around nine minutes left. Sounds good, sounds good. Is there any, any question about this example before I now move to a more, to a broader discussion? So, sorry, Joe, one just one quick question. So the previous S0, you got S0, and uh, I mean, S in the SL, the delta L equal to zero is real. So uh, even at large S, your S, I mean, your SL, uh, mod SL is just one, right? I mean, is that? Uh, uh, that's a very good question. Um, yeah. the, the mod, the, so you're asking about particle production, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Saturated yeah. in the two yes. to two channel. Um, numerically, what we see is that at low energy and low spin, unitarity uh, tends to be saturated. But um, I mean, for this finite value of n equals twenty four, as you go to higher energies, you will see deviations from uh, Mod, so let me write it. So mod of SL will be less than one at higher energy. So if you plot it, it's going to be something like uh, if you plot mod of S0, for example, as a function of S, it will start here at one, we'll have some oscillations, but then at higher energy, we'll have some more oscillations. Okay, so that's the typical scenario with a finite number of variables. But what we see, is that if you increase n, then these wiggles go a bit further and become smaller. So this is n increasing, n increasing like that. Okay. So in some sense, it seems that the numerics want to really uh, be fully elastic, that the optimal scattering amplitude wants to be fully elastic. But in fact, it can never get there because there, there's even some theorems that in higher dimensions, you cannot get a fully elastic S matrix. There's always some, at least some asymptotic inelasticity at large spin. I hope Thank I you. answered it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thank you. TIFR has a question. TIFR, unmute yourself. Hi, hi, Joe. Uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, this uh, uh, alpha that you want to measure. So the way you define it as the coefficient of this, uh, this term in the Lipson uh, you know, equation, the, one of the Lipson coefficients, but your S matrix had all sorts of features all the way up to zero. So yeah. even in principle, how does one, how does one, uh, uh, you know, pull out this particular uh, Lipson coefficient from there? And uh, second question is, you know, the way you parameterize your S matrix, it seemed to uh, 
you know, uh, make uh, this uh, even more difficult. If you expand it at S equal to 1, how would you get uh, anything near S equal to 0? Yeah, the, okay, this is a good question. So, so the to identify alpha, so alpha for me is really defined, is really defined from this expansion of the S matrix. Okay, so the relation with this effective action is just because we know it, but I'm not using the effective action at all, it's just a Taylor expansion around S equals zero. Actually, around S T U equals zero with the same ratio. So we it's really a low energy expansion. Um, Sorry, but so, you can't do the so technically, yeah, you're right. That you since the rows are defined uh, centered around here, this point s equal minus one, uh, basically all terms in principle contribute. But you see, at finite ten, this is just trivial algebra. It's just some polynomial. I just expand. So at finite ten. Um, I can just do it. I can take my ansatz and expand around the, around this point because it's a it's just a finite sum, so I can uh, I can expand it around this uh, s equals zero point, which is what I need to do to measure alpha. So that's what we do. Sorry, if the chair allows, I can just uh, you know uh, pursue this a little bit more. I, I couldn't. Uh, yeah, can you repeat that? Yeah, I, I also couldn't hear you. No, I, I just meant if you allow me, I can ask a little bit more about this now, or should I wait? George, do you want maybe, to finish the discussion and then take questions? Maybe it's better. Otherwise, uh, you okay, know, I, yeah, I, will I like. Um, yeah. Usually, <laughs> it's better to take questions because people don't ask many, but uh, in India, is a very good culture of asking many questions. So maybe let me finish. So, um, okay, so I have a few slides of general remarks. So the first is about generalizations of this problem. So the obvious thing to go to study is to study higher, different space-time dimensions, still with maximal supersymmetry. And uh, in particular, I think D equal 11 should be very interesting because in D equal 11, what we know from M theory is a single number. There is no free parameter, so it, alpha in M theory can only take one value. And uh, I wonder what the S matrix can tell us about that. Yeah, so, so that's an open question. Of course, it would also be very interesting to do four dimensions, but there we have a conceptual obstacle because there the S matrix, strictly speaking, is not well defined. It's, uh, there are infrared divergences. So one needs to define some finite quantity and then understand its properties so that we can run this game of having a physical observable and its consistency conditions and then get bounds from that. Okay, so in four dimensions, I think there is a lot of conceptual work to do to, I mean, there are proposals in the literature about IR safe uh, uh, dress test matrices, but as far as I know, nobody really try to list the rules that this dress test matrix satisfies so that we can run the bootstrap. In particular, I think unitarity should be quite non-trivial for these dress test matrices. Then another comment is inelasticity. So we already talked about that. So there is some inelasticity that we expect from black hole production at high energies and also from three graviton production at low energies, three and four. So we can also compute that in defective field theory. So we could try to make a better model instead of just saying S is bounded by one, we could say S is bounded by some function that we compute using low and high energy uh, knowledge from gravity and see how that changes the bound. And uh, well, of course, no Susie and other rules and coefficients I think would be very interesting because in string theory, then you can start to play with uh, with like two dimensional allowed regions and things like that. So I think the most important and most present present thing is the to have a better numerical formulation, and um, this is what we are working on. Because really we are hitting the wall with this numerical algorithm that I presented presented. 
And uh, the better numerics are usually the dual algorithms. Okay, so this is some technical thing in, in optimization problems. You can have primal methods and dual methods. And the, essentially the difference is that in the primal method, you actually build a solution and you approach the optimal from within, like we did. While in the dual method, you build some functional that excludes solutions and you approach the bound, the optimal bound from outside. And it turns out that usually the dual methods are more efficient. And that's exactly actually in conform field theory, what is used is a dual method. So that's part of the reason the conformal bootstrap is so successful. So it would be important to develop dual methods for uh, the S matrix bootstrap. And there's already a lot of work in that direction, especially in two dimensions. In D greater than two, there is only these two papers. And uh, this paper in particular from Andre and Amit is very interesting because they are able to divide, to set up a dual method only using proven analytistic assumptions in quantum field theory. The, the, the disadvantage is that they can only do it for theories with a mass gap. Okay, so it doesn't apply to this specific problem, but for theories with a mass gap, there is now a dual method that is completely uh, safe, even in terms of analyticity assumptions. This method assumes Mandelstam analyticity. So in principle, it can be applied to massless, but yeah, we need to explore it more. So far, the, the result is, there is only this paper, we, and so we are working on it. So I think this is a very important frontier in the topic. So I wanted to make a comment between uh, what we're doing and between what many people, other people are doing, in, including uh, Aninda, which, and, and emphasize the difference, okay? So, so unitarity can be written like this condition, okay? So this is just writing SL in this, in this standard form. And you see the non-linear condition. And this, there is a weaker condition that follows from it, which is positivity. And positivity is already a very strong condition that has been used to derive many, many bounds in Wilson, in, in Wilson coefficients. Um, but let me just tell you what happens in this example. So in the example that we have studied, positivity can never give better than alpha greater than zero because the supergravity amplitude is already real. So the imaginary part is zero. So there is no problem with the pure supergravity amplitude. So positivity will never improve this bound. To improve, to get a bound like this, you really need nonlinear unitarity, okay? So the advantage of working with positivity is that you can do lots of analytic stuff and dual numerical stuff, very systematic and so better numerics. The nonlinear part is harder as I explained. And so I think there is a lot of room to improve and try to translate or update some of these better methods that have been developed for positivity to the nonlinear case. I think this is a very important thing to do. And uh, I'm probably running out of time and I need, okay. So my final comment is about uh, when you actually want to study a quantum field theory, you know stuff about the quantum field theory usually, right? So in QCD, we know the UV, right? We know that quarks and gluons are free at short distances. And so we know something about pion scattering. We know, for example, hard, hard scattering, okay? So can we input some information into the S-matrix bootstrap that specifies what is the UV theory that of the quantum field theory we want to study? So this is a very important question that is mostly open, but we've done some progress. So here I show you one example. So in two dimensions, you can access the central charge of the UV CFT by doing a kind of a mixed bootstrap that joins the S matrix with form factors and spectral densities of the trace of the stress tensor. 
And so I'm showing you here a plot. If you assume a 2D quantum field theory with this spectrum, so with the ON global symmetry and with this mass spectrum, then there is a lower bound on the UV CFT, uh, the central charge of the UV CFT that grows with N. Okay, so that's one example where you relate UV CFT behavior with the S matrix bootstrap. And we're doing something similar in four dimensions using the dilaton scattering. Okay, so by putting together the scattering of physical particles with this probe dilaton of Komagorsky Schwimmer, we are able to access the A anomaly of a 4D quantum field theory together with the S matrix bootstrap. Okay, but this is this is still work in progress. So and uh, and since I didn't have time to cover all the many open problems that are in the topic, let me encourage you to go and see the slides of the discussion session that Sasha and I prepared for the strings, where you have a big list of open problems for you to think over Christmas. I just stole one slide that I just leave here if you want to discuss something um, about this list of open questions. But there are many more in the, in the discussion session at strings. Thank you very much. Sorry for going over time. Okay, Th thanks, Joe. Uh, it was a very nice review talk. Uh, we had a lot of questions during the talk, and we are already five minutes over the schedule. Uh, so, Joao, uh, are you going to be around for the discussion session, between, uh, which is going to be uh, from five forty-five IST to six fifteen IST? So that's uh, two uh, two hours and fifteen. Well, two and a half hours from now. I actually today I have this end of the semester is quite okay. packed, but okay. I, but I okay. can try. So, so we are going to take try. some questions. So let's take some questions now. Then there were there was a there's a raised hand. Shomdatta has a hand raised. Yeah. So I, I was just wondering. I was just wondering uh, how you get the uh, extra terms, the rows, uh, rows to something, rows to something, rows to something terms. You, are you using effective field theory methods to compute the scattering amplitudes? How are you computing those terms? I'm 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 not computing them. So so the notice that the coefficients are free parameters. I'm just parameterizing my ignorance about this S matrix. Okay, so this is just an ansatz that satisfies the properties I listed here. It is Lorentz invariant, it is crossing symmetric, it's analytic, and it matches the low energy effective field theory. Okay. It's just an ansatz. You can you can choose another one. The good thing of these ansatz is that the parameters that the free parameters enter linearly. And as I take this n to infinity, I can cover a very big space of S matrices. Okay. So and how do you get the betas? So the betas are free parameters and they are obtained by the optimization. Then I ask a question within the spa this space of S matrices, which of these S matrices has the lowest alpha, okay? Where alpha is computed, okay? So alpha is a trivial computation will be some specific linear combinations of the, of the betas, beta A, B, C, times some number, some known function of ABC that follows from Taylor expanding this around S equals zero. Okay, so I minimize, I say minimize this thing within the space of betas subject to the unitarity constraints. And that's what fixes the betas. And do you consider higher spin particles or particles of all, all possible spins or just scalars? So the external particles, um, well, in the physical problem, they are the full supermultiplet, but in the end, it reduces to these charged scalars. So that's the only amplitude I consider. Uh, why, why does it reduce to the charged scalars? I, uh, Shomato, there are lots of other hands raised. Uh, can I just recommend that you can uh, probably write to Joe? In private and clarify this. Otherwise, uh, others won't have a chance to clarify that. Yeah. Is that okay, Shomdatto? I'm very sorry about this. We're already running over time. 
sorry about yes uh, sorry to cut you off uh, so i mean you have your hand raised please uh, yes thank you uh, yeah thanks for your talk um, yeah i'll try to keep it short um, i had a, a basic question regarding the first part of your talk so there were you had a slide where you mentioned uh, the similarities between the the cft and the s matrix uh, four point function trap so um, maybe one thing which is yes, so maybe one thing which is uh, quite different, uh, perhaps, uh, is that if you uh, it, it's well known that because of the um, uh, because of the finite radius of convergence of the OP, once you impose crossing symmetry on every four point function, there is no additional constraint coming from crossing symmetry of higher point functions. So uh, this, of course, uh, would not be true when you consider general quantum theories. So um, so unlike the CFT case. Uh, this is perhaps also partly a comment, but uh, I guess, uh, is this true that, for example, if you uh, do everything, you get all the constraints of the Nielsen coefficients from four point functions. Uh, once you go to five or six point amplitudes, you will, you will just get additional, additional constraints, which, which are not there in any four point amplitude. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a very good comment. So this is uh, another difficulty in the estimated bootstrap is how to impose all constraints systematically. So the first step looks more or less the same, but as you say, in the conformal case, we can just add more four-point functions. And in fact, to get the islands I was showing, people yeah. have done several four-point functions. But in the S matrix, well, you can put several two to two scattering amplitudes, but you will run out of that as soon as you do everything you can with the stable particles that you have at infinity, which are usually a finite set. Mm -hmm. So, so in the S matrix, it seems that if you want to be systematic, you will have to study two to three scattering and two to four and all n to m scattering amplitudes. While in the conformal bootstrap, there is this systematic way that if you just increase, if you just look at more operators and look at four point functions of all operators, that's enough. I, I agree with you. It's a different. Um, it's another qualitative difference between the two between the two as it, bootstraps. Okay, thank you. Well, there is one speculation that uh, actually in the in the strings conference, um, Chi Yin was suggesting that maybe if we look at scattering amplitudes of resonances, then we will also have infinite number of them. But this is very speculative. I don't know if really it makes sense to define non-perturbatively scattering amplitudes of resonances which are and then and then study that but maybe that's one direction one could imagine okay so thanks i will allow for two quick questions uh, so alok lada uh, alok please yeah thanks yeah so just one small question java so as you were saying that the we are interested in uh, analyzing these amplitudes for positive s and from low energy perspective, you are looking at like as close to zero. So you can do, as you were saying, maybe some wave packet analysis, even though the sum is strictly speaking not convergent uh, at the at the boundary of the circle. Yeah, yeah. But if, if I wanted to use this ansatz to compute amplitude for physical S, some finite S, I mean, is there a, how, how would we go about doing it? I mean, we know this is not the right ansatz maybe, right, for positive S away from S equal to zero. Uh, but is there some improved answers we could use? Or... Hello? Hello? Um, yeah. I, I mean, this is a long discussion. I, I think. Okay, sure. Let, yeah. Let's okay. put it this way. Let's say, let's say this is just an ansatz for any finite n. This is a good scattering amplitude. And uh, yes. you can look at it now if the n equals infinity is really a good function or there is some distribution right. with some complicated limit, I think this is unclear at the moment. Thank you. Okay, last quick questions uh, from TIFR. Uh, hi, Shah, that was a beautiful, very simple, very uh, clear talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, one, one quick question about the, the last part, the last slide, you, you, were, you, were look, you suggested that we could do the same thing for the M theory. Example where you had a unique number for us. So I was wondering whether you expected your considerations to zero in that unique number. And uh, if so, what would that mean? Would it mean that um, if you put all the constraints for all L, 
Um, in general, there will be no solution unless you choose your n equals infinite. At any finite n, you will have no solution that you put all the, the constraints at every n, and then you would have to go all the way to infinite n to get a solution at all. Is that what it would mean? Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I'm pessimistic. I think it will be very difficult to exclude the very large alpha because large alpha is like weakly coupled. So I think if you just add, I feel that if you just add some particle, some some light particle to the graviton, to super grav, you will generate some very large alpha. It's hard for me to see how it can be excluded, but, uh, but I guess you're asking how could it happen technically in terms of this extrapolation in large N and large L. Um, I guess the simplest way to see it would be if you had a, a dual method, because in a dual method, one would uh, approach the bound from the outside and would try to squeeze. So if there was a upper and a lower bound for alpha, and then we'll kind of squeeze on the exact value of M theory. With a primal method, it's harder, it's harder to imagine. I guess it would have to be bit like you're saying that if you put finite number of constraints, you would see some alpha allowed. And then as you increase number of constraints, this region that disappears. And, uh, and then you have to study like how the region grows with N and decreases with L and again, do these limits carefully. But I mean, this is very speculative. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a clear picture in mind yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let, 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 let's thank Joao again for a, a very nice review talk. And we 